Professor Howard Phillips is an emeritus professor in the Historical Studies Department of the University of Cape Town. He specializes in the social history of medicine, focusing especially on epidemics and pandemics, medical education and hospitals. We'll explore how COVID-19 seems to have laid bare our primal fears as well as the human aptitude to learn or not to learn from history. Firstly, pandemics reveal the underpinnings of society. They give a clear indication of what's happening below the surface of, of society. I, I can draw uh, uh, an example from the writings of the third century AD, uh, St. Cyprian, the Bishop of Carthage, writing in the midst of a devastating pandemic, wrote, pestilence and plague, search out the righteousness of each and every one and examine the minds of the human race. It's almost like applying an X-ray to a situation and you see what's happening below the surface. The second is that pandemics reveal underlying attitudes, attitudes to others, attitudes to those around us who might be regarded as different in some ways. Finger pointing, who's to blame? Who's responsible for this devastating uh, e epidemic? And this is a very standard human response. Someone or something who is responsible and perhaps to take action uh, against them. A third effect of epidemics is that they tend to escalate patterns and trends which are perhaps already taking place, but very slowly within a, a society to speed up processes or forces which are already in a society, but which don't actually uh, yet manifest themselves. The fourth is that they sometimes introduce entirely novel and entirely unexpected features into society. In a sense, they initiate things which you would not have anticipated. They bring about situations which could not easily be foreseen. And then finally, the fifth of the ways in which we can recognize patterns which epidemics, pandemics, global pandemics produce is that they trigger a uh, wish for reform. Most obviously, reform of health and public uh, public health issues, but not exclusively. They could trigger reforms of social nature, of medical nature, of societal nature. They produce that kind of crisis which pushes politicians, states people to say, right, now we need to act. We need to introduce some kind of reform. What I want to do now is to take examples. The first uh, example I want to draw is from the devastating smallpox epidemics which hit the subcontinent from the beginning of the 18th century through until the end of the 19th century. Completely devastated the indigenous Khoikhoi population. Here's a contemporary sketch of a Khoikhoi funeral. The Khoikhoi had no previous uh, exposure to smallpox, and it absolutely decimated their numbers. It reduced them to a servile status, much, much reduced in numbers. In fact, one of the consequences of smallpox is that if you contract smallpox and survive, you were left infertile, which meant that the Khoikhoi population could not reproduce repeatedly in 1713, in 1755, in 1767, in 1812, in 1840, eight or nine of these sweeping smallpox epidemics. The second example I want to draw is from the bubonic plague epidemic at the beginning of the 20th century, starting in, in, in China, hit uh, particularly Cape Town and then eventually uh, uh, Johannesburg. And what this uh, slide illustrates is the way in which people were scapegoated and the fingers were turned onto the stevedores at the harbour in Cape Town 
where the epidemic had been introduced. And the stevedores were black Africans, those who were beginning to migrate to Cape Town from the second half of the 19th century. They were regarded as a minority, as other, as not part of us. And consequently, fingers were pointed at them. And already before the plague hit Cape Town, there was talk that they should be moved out of central Cape Town. They should be racially segregated. However, uh, this remained talk until the plague hit. And when the plague hit, immediately fingers pointed. They are responsible. What that slide shows is the uh, um, Africans from District 6 being forcibly removed. You can see uh, uh, troops uh, marching alongside them, being forcibly removed from District 6 to a plague camp, it was called, on the Cape Flats, which eventually became Dabeni, a minority identified, scapegoated, and then action taken, action which previously had not really been possible, but under the fear, under the threat of death as a result of epidemics, action was taken. And that's the beginning of residential segregation of Africans in uh, uh, Cape Town and subsequently in, in uh, uh, Southern Africa. Perhaps even more dramatic is what happened when bubonic plague moved into the interior and hit Johannesburg in 1904. And what this did was to have the British authorities turn on Johannesburg and particularly on an area, uh, a, a rather rundown slumish, slum area called then called Cooley Location, where the population was racially mixed, African, Indian, and, and colored. And this, it, to the British authorities, was for some years already regarded as something which was unacceptable, that they should be living right in the center of, uh, of Johannesburg. Immediately, the authorities acted and said, we must remove this plague spot. And what they did, and this dramatic uh, uh, photograph shows, is quite literally, they raised to the ground Cooley location. They set it on fire and forcibly removed the entire population to a sewage farm about 12 miles west of Johannesburg. At this uh, resettlement, Indians, Africans, and coloreds were settled in separate areas alongside each other. Out at this plague farm called Clipsprit, west of Johannesburg, after the plague had passed, Indians and coloreds were allowed to return to Johannesburg, but not Africans. Africans were told, henceforth, this is where you will stay. And this became the heart of the African residential uh, component of the population of Johannesburg. The significance is that Clipsprit in the 1930s became known as Pimville, and in the 1950s, Pimville became the core of Soweto. So Soweto's location today actually goes back to the forced removal of Africans in 1904. The third example is over the Spanish flu of 1918, 1919. Absolutely devastating. 300,000 people dead in six weeks, probably five or six percent of the total population. The Spanish flu revealed the slum conditions in which many uh, whites lived in, in uh, Cape Town in particular in, in, in this example. And one of the consequences was to say, as a result of what we have seen, what has been revealed in uh, the Spanish flu, we need to make better provision for housing for whites. And at the initiative of uh, a, a wealthy benefactor, money was set aside together with uh, support from the union government to create the first garden city, a well laid out, very, very healthy, salubrious suburb for Cape Town called Pinelands. And this is the uh, stone which marks the establishment of Pinelands as one of these opportunities, one of these attempts to remedy the poor housing conditions for uh, particularly for, for working class whites, for lower middle class whites. And so here's an example of how the, uh, a, a pandemic can trigger a health response, in this case, a housing response, because the revelation of the epidemic has been such as to promote and 
produce action. Interestingly, and again tellingly in terms of long consequences, the Union government, in response to the Spanish flu, passed the first Housing Act in 1920 to provide central government funding for housing for the population. The fourth uh, uh, epidemic that I want to refer to is the polio epidemic of the 1940s and 1950s. Polio is an unusual disease in that for immunological and public health reasons, it tended mostly to uh, uh, attack whites, particularly young whites, a coming generation. And in early apartheid South Africa, this was a source of immense fear, of immense panic in uh, government circles. And consequently, though polio really affected only a relatively small part of the population, that part of the population which was affected was that which had political clout, white individuals, and consequently enormous mobilization of resources against polio. Here you can see Durban's Addington Hospital with the iron lungs, the state-of-the-art technology to deal with cases of polio laid out. So no expense was spared to deal with the uh, outbreak of polio, particularly amongst whites. And what this does, again, is lay bare the underpinnings, in this case, the power underpinnings of the society. In many ways, what you can see here is the result of a constructed epidemic, the way in which an outbreak was turned into a major, major source of fear, prompting immense government action. There was a huge public appeal for funds, which produced just from the public, something of what today would be the equivalent of perhaps 300 million rand for a polio research foundation. And then finally, to come to uh, slightly more recent times, HIV AIDS, beginning in the 1980s, immediately because of the nature of the disease and the way in which it was primarily transmitted, produced finger pointing. Who's to blame? Who's responsible? And those who are responsible must in some way be identified and dealt with. And here, poignantly, dramatically, we see one of the consequences of stigmatization. A poster recalling what happened to an HIV positive woman in uh, Kwamashu in uh, Durban, Gugu Dlamini, who went public. Uh, who appeared uh, on talk shop, uh, on talk radio and talked about her condition. And this so angered, so alienated, so antagonized those in her neighborhood that they attacked her, as this says, and uh, beat her. And eventually she died of this attack. So here's an example, again, of the way in which epidemics lay bare attitudes which uh, to the other to those who are identified as responsible, and consequently, they are, in this case, uh, forcibly uh, removed from society and, 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 and uh, are killed. So here are five examples of the ways in which serious epidemics, pandemics, uh, produce effects which are often very long-lasting indeed. And the significance for us now in the midst of COVID-19 is that not, the epidemics are not absolutely uh, duplicates of each other. They vary, but by and large, there are similarities. And if we are aware of these similarities, the five which I've uh, uh, labeled here, revelation, revelation about the underpinnings of society, revelation uh, uh, about attitudes to other, uh, the way in which they speed up uh, forces or trends which are already imminent in a society, the way in which they initiate, they introduce new features, and finally the way in which they trigger responses. Then we should be in looking at COVID-19, recognize these features and say, ah, here are yet further examples of this standard human response. Epidemics are not without significant precedents. And what we need to do if we want to handle COVID-19 and any future epidemics is understand the ways in which human societies respond and anticipate them.
Thank you very much indeed.